Hello and welcome to part four of my talks on the geology of Iceland for everyone. In this uh, talk, I will discuss Gullfoss, the golden waterfall, and then move on uh, to Reykjavik to complete the golden circle. But on the way to Reykjavik, we will stop at several locations to look at geologically interesting uh, structures and features. So if we look first at the uh, overview, the map, then we are now here. In the last talk, we were here in, uh, in Gese, and we drive then to location 11, which is Gullfoss, and discuss how Gullfoss formed and its canyons uh, formed and are developing. And then we move all the way from Gullfoss and gradually down here, uh, this road, part of the golden circle. But stop at location 12 to look at some mountains, how they are shaped, how the geometry is, 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 is made really uh, at a, a crater here called Kirith in number 13. We will take a look at Ingols Fjall, an interesting mountain here. Then we move to 14, where we can see uh, lava flows that are, are historically very important in Iceland. And then we go to 15, just around the time when we enter Reykjavik and complete the Golden Circle. We see some pseudo craters or rootless craters that are of great interest to, to us and also form part of the lava flow that flowed into Reykjavik 5,200 years ago in the Reykjavik area. All these numbers refer to locations that are described in much greater detail, of course, in the two books that you are familiar with now, namely the glorious geology of Iceland's Golden Circle and the German translation of, of that book. These uh, books, of course, are for the general reader and no specific geological knowledge is uh, needed to understand them. They describe, as I say, what we see here and discuss in these talks in much, much greater detail. So here we are at the Golden Waterfall, Gullfoss, and it is located in a river called Kvidau or White River, which is one of the main rivers in, in Iceland. Now, part of the beauty of Gullfoss is because it has two main steps. The upper step here, you see the people here for scale, and the lower step. Together, the total drop, the, the total height of the waterfall is around 32 meters. Now, these steps meet at an acute angle of around 60 degrees, as I will discuss and explain in the next slides. So here's an aerial view of Gullfoss and its canyon. The upper waterfall are marked by the letter A. The lower waterfall is marked by the letter C. And the main canyon is marked by the letter B and the broken lines. Now, what are these A, B, and C? They are fractures. They are fractures. They are, in fact, earthquake fractures. They are faults. So if we look at them in detail, we see that the upper step of fracture A strikes or as a direction of north 75 east, north 75 east. That means 75 degrees east of north, true north. North is indicated here. Then we have fracture B, which has a strike or orientation or direction of north 40 degrees east. And finally, fracture C, which has the strike of north 15 degrees east, north 15 degrees east. I said there were earthquake fractures. Well, what does that mean? 
Fracture B, this one here, parallel with the canyon, is a normal fault, similar to what we saw in, in uh, Thingwelli, Almanagiao, for example. Fractures A and C, however, are what we call strike-slip faults. So in, in B, the movement of the fracture walls is up and down, up and down. But in A and C, the movements of the fracture walls is horizontal, lateral, horizontal, lateral. And they are of different types. They're called strike step faults, but the A fault, this one here, the movements of the walls is what we call sinistral, that is left lateral. Whereas in, in C, the movement is dextral or right lateral. Now the movements are indicated by these white arrows. So what does dextral and sinistral mean? It means if you stand here or here and look across the fault, then the movement here on this wall would be to the right. Similar, if you stand here and look across it, it would again be to the right. So therefore it's called right lateral or dextral. If you stand here at fault A, and you look across the fault, the broken line, then the movement would be to the left. So therefore it's left lateral or sinistral. Left lateral sinistral. So we call them dextral and sinistral strike slip faults. And we will see them throughout Southern Iceland, as I will show to you in, in a moment. So let's have a closer look at Gullfoss. This is the upper step. So that is controlled by one fracture, fracture or fault strike or direction. And this is the lower step. It is controlled by a different one. So we have discussed these A faults and the C faults. The upper step has a total, uh, total uh, fall or drop. Uh, of, or height, if you like, of 11 meters, whereas the lower step has a total drop or height of 21 meters. So together they are 32 meters. You can see the people here for scale. But we notice while the lower step is a single one, basically, the upper step is composed of many smaller steps. And I will explain those in a moment because they relate to the layering. So the layers have different hardness, are, are, their, their, their strength as regards erosion differs and therefore they form these steps here, they form these steps. This is a part, this is the canyon, the sea here is the canyon extending from the lower step. Canyon is extending from the lower step and I mark it by C. And you can see that Canyon C is oblique, is oblique to Canyon B. It's oblique to Canyon B. So the Canyon B is the normal fault canyon, is the main canyon, whereas C is oblique and follows one of the strike slip faults. And they meet at an angle of roughly 35 degrees. 35 degrees. So what are the rocks that constitute these canyons? Well, we see them here. First of all, we notice that the walls are basically vertical. The walls are basically vertical. Then we notice as well that they are primarily basaltic lava flows. This one here and another one there. There are some sediments in between. I'll discuss those in a moment. But the lava flows are, are, are lava flows and they contain numerous cooling or columnar joints, which makes it easy for the water to erode them, to break them down. There are weaknesses that the, the water in the river uses 
to erode them. So here we are at the upper step again, and you see there is a remnant of a lava flow here, very thin where the people are standing. So this has been mostly eroded away, and underneath are sedimentary layers, and the lava flow again here, basaltic lava flow again here. But the sedimentary layers, some of them are relatively hard or strong, others are much weaker. So the hard or strong ones are more resistant to erosion. And that's the reason we have these steps, these small steps in the upper main step. The small rock steps are because the layers are of different hardness, different strength as regards erosion by the river. So how did the river canyon really form and how long time did it take to form? Well, to, to look at it, we need to first look at the geometry. And we see that the, the, the walls, as we saw in, in the other photos, the walls are mostly vertical. That means it has not, the canyon has not been eroded by glaciers because then they would be U-shaped. The canyon would be U-shaped, which it's definitely is not. It has vertical walls, not U-shaped geometry. So the entire 2.5 kilometer long canyon must be younger than the last glaciers from the last ice, ice period, the last glaciers in this part of Iceland. And when did this part become ice-free? When did the glaciers melt? Well, around eight to 9,000 years ago. Eight to 9,000 years ago, which means that the canyon presumably has been formed or has been forming or expanding, growing really during the past eight to 9,000 years. So if the entire canyon, 2.5 kilometer long, formed in the past eight to 9,000 years, it means it was growing on average by around 30 centimeter per year. That means it's expanding on average every year by around 30 centimeter in this direction. As I indicate schematically here by, by this, this uh, yellow arrow. So eventually good forces go to move further in inland really and presumably change its shape. Uh, but this is a process that takes a very, very long time. And this is just the average. So it occurs presumably in steps, but this is the average growth rate of the canyon inland is, is around 30 centimeters per year. So now we have finished looking at Gutfoss, the golden waterfall, and we move down here and to this road, which is a part of the golden circle, and we stop at several places. The first one we stop at would be here to look at these mountains. And then we stop, stop at number 13 to look at the, the crater, Kerith. We look at uh, Ingolsfjall, again, to look at earthquake fractures, the lava flow seen here, and then finally the pseudo craters there. But already here, you see the mountains have specific shapes and there is a striking trend or direction seen in most of them here. This one is Mosfell, that is Vördufell, this is Hestfjall, that is Ingolsfjall, and you see even in Burfell, you can see in all of them certain, certain directions. And I will demonstrate to you that these geometries of these mountains is largely controlled by earthquake fractures. Which earthquake fractures? Well, the same as we saw here in Goodfoss, in the canyon of Goodfoss. The same earthquake fractures are found everywhere, in everywhere here in southern Iceland. And in fact, today, there is an active zone here we call the South Iceland Seismic Zone, where the same types of fractures are seen. The last one, uh, big ones, were in 
2000 and in the year 2000, uh, when we had earthquakes forming in the South Iceland seismic zone, and they had the same directions as we see in these mountains here and all the way up to Goodlos. So let's now look at the mountains. We start here in this area here. Of course, uh, you are not going to see it like that. The, to to demonstrate the effects of the uh, of the uh, fractures on on the shape or geometry of these mountains, it's best to look at them from the air. So unless you you hire an aircraft, you're not going to see it like that. Uh, but I thought I should show show them from the air because then I can demonstrate very nicely the effects of these fractures. Here's the River Quito, uh, where. Good force, of course, is, is located in that river, as we discussed earlier. But already here, we can see the fracture, fractures in the mountains. Morsfeld is not very well seen. We can still see some fractures there. So I focus on Vördefell. Now, Vördefell has a very strange shape in a way. It's, it's similar to a heart symbol or irregular triangle. And it is controlled as regards shape by the earthquake fractures. We can see the fractures here very clearly. Here's one, here's another one. We also see that the sides of the mountains are quite straight. Here's one, the eastern side, and this one here facing to the northwest. So we are looking roughly north, uh, north, 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 northeast directly on, on this aerial photograph. So let's look at the mountain with the main fracture uh, orientations or fracture directions indicated. That we do on the next one here. Yeah. So again, we see these faults here. They can be demonstrated as being faults. Uh, I've done that for this one for particularly. We can see that this is a, is a strike slip fault, really. So we see the fault here. The C faults are there, they are dextral. They are dextral. That is right lateral as indicated by, by the white arrows here. The white arrows indicate they are dextral. Then we have the A fault. These were the C faults. Then we have the A faults. We can see them here in the mountain, very nicely here in the mountain. And of course, forming the side of the mountain. So they are sinistral, they are sinistral. In addition to complete the triangle, we have the B faults, the normal faults, which have this orientation here and I can't be seen inside the mountain as well. This lake here is a consequence of, of, of uh, offset faults going through the, through the mountain and a depression in between them. So this mountain is as regards overall geometry entirely controlled by earthquake fractures. Exactly the same fractures as we saw in Gullfoss. So they are everywhere in Southern Iceland, these, these fractures, these faults, and they control the, the geometries of many of the volcanoes, uh, many of the mountains or former volcanoes. Let's now leave uh, earthquake fractures for a while and uh, look at something from volcanology. We go now to uh, uh, the beautiful Kiri, uh, a small crater of Spartan scoria. Now, these are the most common materials in, in uh, volcanic craters, but what is scoria? Scoria is lava fragments. They derive from the spray of the lava fountains during fissure eruption, similar to the one, of course, that generated Kiri. And the difference between scoria and spatter is that when the fragments from the scoria hit the ground, they are already solid. They're already, they're already solidified. They're hard when they hit the ground. Whereas the clots uh, that generate the spatter, they are still hot and plastic. So they com commonly combine into large flat masses that may in fact flow for a while. So they can flow on, on, on the ground because they are plastic. Now, initially the color would be, 
would be black, but often they become red. The scoria becomes red because of oxidation. Oxidation is simply when oxygen in the atmosphere combines with iron in the rock. So you get this red color. We see it very commonly in, in, in craters of any type, volcanic craters of any type. And in fact, so we'll discuss later on when we come to the pseudo craters, there is a welding as well. Welding is, is uh, when the heat is, is uh, trapped inside the, the, the scoria or, or the spatter and the hot material allows it to, to weld, the grains to weld or the fragments to weld together. They can even flow a little bit. So here's a better overview of, of Kierith. Its maximum diameter, it's slightly elliptical, is around 300 meters. Its minimum diameter is 170 meters. And the overall depth of, of, of the depression is 50 meters. It formed 9,000 years ago and is a part of a 900 meter long volcanic fissure. Often people are speculating on how it, it really formed. And I've seen various ideas presented. One is that the, the Kier is an explosion crater. Another one, it's really a collapse called, but it's neither. It's neither. It is a pit crater, a pit crater. Pit craters are common in the world, or in many volcanoes, famous ones occur, for example, in Kilauea in Hawaii. And they usually form by an abrupt decrease in the overpressure, the magmatic pressure in the feet of dike. So in this particular case, there was presumably a little lava pond inside here. And when the pressure, the magmatic pressure in the, in, in the feet of dike de decreased abruptly, then that lava pond disappeared. It drained out, leaving the dep depression that we now call Kierit. And because the depression goes below the water table, the water table is the level in the rocks uh, where the rocks are saturated with groundwater, because it goes below the water table, it means that there is a little lake here. It's a little lake with an average depth around 10 meters. It fluctuates a little bit. The depth fluctuates, but on, uh, fluctuates, but on average, it's around 10, 10 meters. I said we would have a quick look at uh, Ingolsfjall, uh, the higher crested mountain Ingolsfjall, when we drive towards Reykjavik. On the eastern slope, so eastern side of that mountain, there are a number of boulders, big rocks, and they roll down the slopes, mainly as parts of rock falls or landslides generated during earthquakes. And in fact, in fact, the eastern side of the mountain is partly controlled as regards its orientation by north trending faults of the sea type, so dexterous diastolic faults. And two of these faults can be seen here, and this is not the eastern side, this is the southern side, the southern slope, seen from road one, the main road, the ring road in Iceland, Seen from road one, so here is one sea fault, is another sea fault. So these faults are also those that control the orientation, the geometry of the eastern slope of the mountain as a whole. There is a, a, a quarry here, and we can see very nicely the hyalo, thick hyaloclastic layers. Of course, the main mountain is formed by formed of hyaloclastite, but there are intrusions. And uh, um, here is a horizontal intrusion of a form of magma filled fracture. And when they're horizontal, we call them a sill. Remember, we've discussed dikes, they are super vertical, uh, but the sills are horizontal. They're horizontal, so there's a, a beautiful sill exposed here. So we continue along road one, the main road uh, around Iceland, as I said, the ring road. 
En við sí a lava frá kók svínarhrauns brunni. That was formed in the year 1000. Now, there is a story about it, which I discuss in greater detail in, in, in the books, that when this lava was forming, when the eruption happened, at the same time, the Vikings who lived in Iceland at that time were discussing whether, or debating whether to, to change the official religion in Iceland from, from also through the, the old religion with, uh, with uh, many gods to Christianity. And when the eruption started, some of the Vikings in, in Thingvedli, this was discussed in Thingvedli, that's where our parliament used to be, even in Viking time. When it was uh, being discussed, uh, these uh, people said, well, no wonder this eruption has started because the, the old gods are angry. They're angry because people are pro proposing this change from the traditional religion to Christianity. And then one of the leaders said, well, what made the gods angry when the lava flow on which we stand now formed? Now, why is this remarkable? It's remarkable because he and presumably several others had understood that the relatively old lava flow they were standing on namely the lava flow seen in the walls of Almanagyau, where they had their meeting, that lava flow was formed in an eruption. They understood that these lavas are all formed in eruptions, volcanic eruptions. Now, as a consequence of this uh, comment by him, uh, uh, the argument uh, about the old gods being angry was obviously not uh, holding water and uh, it was decided that Iceland should officially be, uh, be uh, Christian, let's just say Christianity became the official religion in, in, uh, in Iceland uh, in the year 1000. And as a consequence, Svinarhundsbrunn is also known as uh, Christian Turkurhraun, which literally mean the adopting of Christianity lava flow, so the lava flow that formed when Christianity was, was taken up as the official religion in Iceland. Here is an aerial view of uh, part of uh, Svinarins Bruni or Kristni Tökurhraun. And uh, it, it partly covers another flow called Svinarhraun, this one here. So this is Kristen Tökurhraun, uh, or Svinarhraun's Bruni, and this is Svinarhraun. Road one is indicated here, the main main road, the, the ring road we are driving on now towards, towards Reykjavik. And to make things more complex, uh, Svinarhraun is a part of a, of a larger rain, rain, uh, lava flow that we call Leitarhraun. And that one, part of that, the narrow, narrow finger really of that one was the one that flowed into the Reykjavik area, the eastern part of the Reykjavik area, the present Reykjavik area, 5,200 years ago, which we already discussed in, in part one of these, these talks. In addition, we see uh, impressive uh, Hyalokastad mountains, uh, Blaufjöll and Vivelsfjöll. As we enter Reykjavik, then to the south of Road 1, we see a field of pseudo craters or rootless craters known as Rød Holar or the Red Hillocks. Now, such craters are remarkable because they do not really issue any lava. They are entirely a consequence of a lava flow entering a shallow lake or a wetland. Then when the hot magma meets the cold water, there will be hydromagmatic explosions. And that's how these hills or hillocks form, how these craters form. They're shito, they're false craters. They're not real craters in that sense. They just form inside the flowing lava, which is hot, maybe 1200 degrees or 1100 degrees meets uh, cold water and explosions occur, 
that generate these hills, these hillocks here. And this lava flowed, as I said, into the valley of Edlerdaler in Eastern Reykjavik 5,200 years ago. Here's a close up of one of the Shito craters in Red Hola showing a red scoria, which I had explained earlier in Kiri, this is a consequence of oxidation when oxygen combines with iron in the rock. And in addition, we see this welding, the welded layer here. And I mentioned to you the heat may be trapped inside certain parts of, of, of the rapidly piling up craters. And they, the, the heat contained there results in the still hot particles may kind of weld together to form these welded layers here. These are very, very common in, in, in craters, crater cones and craters of all, all types, volcanic craters of all types. I should mention that the scoria of Rehora has been used for decades as a foundation material for road construction. It is not done anymore, but as a consequence, the crater we are seeing here is just the remains of the origin, original crater. But as a consequence, we of course uh, see, see the internal structure of the crater very well. Now we have completed the classic golden circle. However, in the books, and here in these talks, I decided to give some additional excursions outside the uh, real golden circle. And the first one of these, which will be the next talk, is on the geological structures and processes that can be seen in the beautiful fjord of Kvalfjord. That fjord is just north of Reykjavik. And you see some of the mountains in that fjord here. We're looking uh, to, to the east along that fjord. And it allows us, when we go there, to understand what processes go on at depth inside volcanoes or inside volcanic drift zones at one kilometer depth. That makes it possible for us to connect what we see at depth two processes that occur at the surfaces in volcanoes, active volcanoes and active rift zones. So with these words, I simply say, thank you very much indeed. And bye bye.